experiences of art and ways of performing art that you've been talking about, whether it's possible to discuss them as a single entity. Are they a single entity or a single practice or is there a single experience that we could call the experience of art? And in order to do that, I want to break up the three classes like this. Today we're going to talk about analytic aesthetics, we'll come back to what that, what that might mean. Uh, tomorrow we'll talk about continental aesthetics and for the final class on Wednesday uh, I'll try to uh, justify the way I've been really drawing on these two traditions to advance a theory of art and to talk about what might be missing from that theory, whether the, the, the work that I've done focusing on literature can spread can, can be applied to these other arts or whether something completely different is, is necessary. So I'll begin the, 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 each of these classes by talking for a bit but I don't want to talk for too long because I want to hear what you have to say and I want you to raise questions uh, and in doing so please feel free to draw on the particular examples that you've been studying. So if you want to make a point about the relevance of a particular theoretical argument to the visual arts and you have a particular um, sculpture in mind, let's see if we can find it thanks to Google and we can use that. So, so the idea is to draw on your discussions and thoughts about particular artworks and particular uh, types of art from the past um, two months, however long it's been, um, in talking about these more general questions. And let me, let me remind you what questions I put on the, um, the description of the course. The first question I've already touched on, is it possible to generalize across all the arts? Or if you, if you do generalize across all the arts, is it so, so general, so vague a generalization as not to be particularly useful? Secondly, do the arts offer a distinctive experience that other practices don't, that say reading history or journalism or um, scientific periodicals don't give you? Is, is the, is the, is, if there is such a thing as an aesthetic experience or an experience of art, is it distinctive? And if so, what, what does that distinct, distinction mean? consist of. Thirdly, is there a distinctive Western tradition of art, art, artistic experience, if you're thinking in terms of experience? Um, are the kinds of enjoyment or the kinds of insight that artists in Western cultures expect their viewers or their readers or their listeners to have, is, are, are those experiences distinctive to that Western culture, should we be thinking of different ways in which what we might call art, or we might want to call it something else, um, it, it occurs and is, is enjoyed in other, in other cultures. And finally is the distinction between high art and popular art one that's important? Uh, do we have to make different, um, do we have to come up with different ways of analyzing those, those two categories if those two categories are viable ones in the first place? So analytic aesthetics, primarily a branch of what we think of as Anglo-American philosophy, or analytic philosophy, um, as opposed to continental philosophy, which we'll come to tomorrow. And I suggested you read three texts by three of the most influential analytic philosophers who've delved into the question of the arts and aesthetics more generally. Morris Weitz, Arthur Danto, George Dickey. Now, as the name suggests, analytic philosophy and therefore analytic aesthetics prides itself on its capacity to analyze, to analyze rigorously logically, carefully, to come up with clear and distinct answers to the questions that it raises. It's, it's a very non-literary way of doing philosophy, if, if you see what I mean. Tomorrow we'll look at continental philosophers who are much more willing to write as almost literary 
figures. Their, their writing has more, much more of a literary quality, but we're dealing here with, with analytic philosophers who are trying to be um, as precise as possible and therefore come, often come across as rather dry. As you might expect, given that approach, one of their recurring questions is, can we define art? They're looking for a definition of art. And by definition, they mean something specific. They mean coming up with sufficient and necessary conditions for the thing we call art, for the concept of art. It's all about this concept which we carry around apparently in our heads, at least in, in the West. Um, are there necessary conditions? Is there something that everything we call a work of art has to have? And are, are there sufficient, is whatever you're proposing, is it a sufficient condition, which is to say, does it leave anything out or is that all that matters? So necessary and sufficient. Within this tradition, there are many, many approaches. And some of these, uh, if you've read the article by George Dickey, I uh, gave you, he tries to um, go through many of the most important approaches. In fact, Morris Weitz does too, but in a rather more sketchy manner. So let me just go through a few of these ways of thinking about art. Not because I want you to internalize the history of aesthetic, um, analytic aesthetics, but because these are ways, these, these are proposals which are worth thinking about as we try to answer those initial questions that I raised. So there's the, the idea that art is expression. It's not a very popular idea these days, but it was certainly um, very powerful in the earlier 20th century. Uh, and, and in many ways, it's close to a kind of popular conception of art. What writers and painters and musicians, composers and others are, are doing is trying to express something. They have a feeling or an idea and they want to express it and they produce a work of art and then uh, readers or viewers receive it in the same spirit and uh, understand what it is or e even share what it is that the artist has put into the work. It's a, it's a view that hasn't lasted very well. There are all sorts of problems about thinking of the, the artwork as a sort of channel between the creator and the, and the receiver. But, uh, but it remains, it hovers around, I think, many ways of thinking about art still today. For a while there was a popular um, notion of art as significant form. This is to say the formal properties of art, something that arose particularly with the post-impressionists in the visual arts when um, representation began to become less central. Uh, and what uh, became clear was that the formal properties of the artwork, whether it be a painting or a, a, a symphony, uh, a, a sonnet, was to be understood primarily as the introduction of form into the matter of the, the artwork, whether that be words or colors or um, sounds. So significant form um, became, became uh, something of a watchword for, for a while. And again, questions of form have remained important, although not many people today would say that form is the only thing that matters to, to, to constitute something as, as art. Then there's a, the, a, a slew of different ways of thinking about aesthetic experience. And it's, in a way, it's what, what, what I've tried to develop in my own thinking. Um, that there's something distinctive about the experience of the, I'm going to say the, the, the receiver to cover viewer, listener, um, and, and, and reader, or someone listening to a poem being read out. All of those, let's just use the word receiver. It's not a very good word, but I, I can't think of another one. Um, we could say audience, I suppose, because that does include the idea of, of hearing. But um, this is an, an approach then to say that what is distinctive about art is not anything inherent or intrinsic in the object, but rather a particular experience which the artwork offers, makes possible for the receiver. 
and you could you could divide these into three these these approaches there are cognitive approaches that's to say the emphasis w is then on what might be learnt from the the art of the artwork the artwork in some in some sense teaches or is concerned with truth or the real and its job is to um, convey as powerfully as possible these truths so it's, it, it's a cognitive uh, experience or it might be uh, what might be emphasized is the, the experience as an affective experience that's to say an emotional experience a kind of feeling that what art offers that no other um, human practice offers is a very distinctive kind of feeling um, so there are, there are many affective uh, approaches. And finally there are approaches that emphasize the play element, play of the imagination, that what art offers is a kind of space of free play where, where the concerns of life are set aside. Art, sometimes the, the word that's used is disinterest, art is disinterested, it's not um, concerned with practicality it's it's a realm where the imagination can can play these aren't um, mutually um, distinct of course it's quite possible for a particular theorist a particular philosopher to be interested in both the say the affective and the cognitive or the imaginative and the cognitive but um, those I would say are the three main strands in, in aesthetic experience Fourthly, um, on a slightly different tack, there are the anti-essentialist approaches, that's to say approaches which say you can't define art. There is no such thing as a single definition of which would cover all artworks. Uh, the big influence here is the philosopher Wittgenstein um, who ad advanced the idea of what he called family resemblances, that when you look at a say a group photo of a large family from grandparents down to small kids um, you can see they all belong to the same family genetically they're all related but there's no single element that every one of them has some of them have a particular nose some of them have particular ears some of them are very tall you couldn't say I define this family by this set of properties but if you looked at them as a whole you would see that because they shared a number of properties not all across the board but in in certain areas you could see they all belong to the same family so um, Morris Wright's uh, in particular advanced the idea of art being this kind of concept um, he also emphasized that it's not it's not a closed concept it follows on from from that idea of art as a uh, as family resemblance is that at any point um, a new work of art comes into being and can can invite the readers or the, 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 the um, receivers to decide is this a work of art or is it not because the concept can always have something added to it so it's an open concept so we don't try to define art we enumerate some of its characteristics but we're always prepared for new characteristics to, to arise or it's sometimes called a cluster concept so not a single definition but a cluster of properties some of which a work of art um, possess any work of art will possess so we're no longer dealing with necessary and sufficient conditions we're dealing with a different way of describing the concept and then very importantly um, we come to the idea uh, of a, an institutional definition of art. Um, art as the product of what became quickly known as the art world, although different philosophers give different meanings to the art world. Um, but the, the major figure here was Arthur Danto, uh, and, and you have a, an essay by him, the short essay that actually really um, set the cat among the pigeons art a work of art can be defined can be can be designated as a work of art if something called the art world says it is it's not again it's not inherently a work of art for its own properties it's a work of art because 
the institution of the art world says it is. Wright's emphasized what he called theories of art, not, not in the sense of philosophical theories, but that any person in a culture has an idea of what constitutes a work of art. And so any, th any object or any um, event that looks like being art can be assessed according to that theory, which is something inherited. So there's a historical dimension as well to Danto's idea. You, you, you've inherited from the past of your culture some idea of what a work of art might, might be, how, how it might be defined, or w w what the limits to the notion of, of art might be. So Arthur Danto, emphasizing particularly these theories of art that, that we carry with us, uh, George Dickey built on Danto's theory, moved it in a slightly different direction, um, by talking more in terms of the, the actual institution, what he called the art public. So it's um, a work of art is, a, is, a, is an artifact produced by someone for uh, reception by and, and, and designation as art by the art public. Knowledgeable people who judge, who judge things um, as art. Another, another addition to this theory, which Dickey didn't himself agree with, is that it's all about who has the authority to designate something as art. And we can then think about art critics or artists themselves, what they say about their own art and other arts, uh, museums when, it, when it's a matter of the visual arts, publishers, editors when it's a matter of, of literature, and so on. That there are bodies which, which the culture recognize, recognizes as having the authority to, to determine what is art. And finally, I'll just mention one more, historical approaches, in the sense that the, the idea is that a work of art is a work of art if it has properties which are similar to those of other works of art which, which belong in the past, so that um, you, know, you know something is art because it's like the works that have been called art in the past. Um, it's a, it's a little different from the, the Danto Dickey position because of its emphasis. It doesn't attempt to say how the works of art become works of art. It just says if it's like a work of art, it's a work of art. You know, if it walks like a duck, it's a duck. So there's always a problem with those, those approaches. How did, how did this start? What was the first work of art? It didn't have a previous work of art to, to refer to. So, so th that's, that's one problem it, it never succeeded in uh, overcoming, I think. Now, notice how these theories of art, in many, in many cases, arise, or new theories arise, because artists in, in any of these fields produce new art, which can no longer be uh, understood or judged in terms of the old definitions. So uh, this is something that um, Danto in particular talks about, um, focusing mostly on visual art. And it's the, for some reason, these analytic philosophers dealing with, with aesthetics focus mostly on visual arts. But um, when, well, the, the example, because they're Americans, the example that comes up most often, and I know Anthony has mentioned this to you, uh, when Andy Warhol makes a, a carton, a box, and copies exactly the insignia of a Brillo box, the um, scrubbing pad, puts it in a museum, it becomes art. Or at least we now, we now think of it as art. But when it first happened, there were, there were big questions. This, this isn't art, many people said, because it didn't conform to existing theories. It didn't look like a work of art. It looked like somebody playing a joke or even more extreme and, and more and, and, and also just as, just as famous and just as constantly mulled over by philosophers when Marcel Duchamp took a urinal 
find that picture for you in case you don't, haven't seen it. And um, there's, there's many, many views. You can see how famous it is. When he took that object, put it in the museum, signed it, Ah Mutt, it became a work of art. And of course there was an uproar. He didn't make this. It's a purely functional object. Where's the craft that we, that we need, expect of a work of art? Where's the skill? None of that. So the, the art world had to come up with, either had to say, no, this is not art, we, you know, take it away, or had to rethink the argument about um, what con constitutes a work of art. Hence the institutional argument that as long as the art world, as long as the institutions of art, as long as the galleries and the critics say it's art, it's art. I mean, obviously questions arise then, could anything be art as long as these, these clever people say it's art or are there, are there limits? Um, but going further back, the move from representation to abstract art, again, created huge problems for theories that were based on the idea that art is a representation, it's an imitation of, of reality and that we learn about reality because the artist has given us a very fine image of, of reality, the, holding the mirror up to nature. Note that um, for some of these philosophers, the intention to produce a work of art is absolutely central. Um, many, many of these attempted definitions talk about the artist's intention to put something forward for the art world to either accept or, or, or reject. Um, but for others, the intention is irrelevant. It's a matter for the receiver of the artwork to decide. Just, I'm, I'm glad you're going to ask the question because I'm going to stop now and I want, I want you to take over the class and to ask some questions. Good. Off you go. So, how important is audience, how is audience important for art, art work? Say that, sorry. I want to know more about audience appraisal. So especially for uh, any art book, we need audience. So how important are the audience for the art work? Be it on high art or popular, popular art. Yeah. And, and, uh, and also want to link that with the audience appraisal. So what exactly is I want to know about what is audience appraisal? Because everybody talks about, it's come to art, okay, audience, that we are, uh, their taste and uh, aesthetics. So they develop uh, we, by the period of time and the kind of work they are ex exposed to. So I want to know more on this. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a big question, isn't it? Um, it's easy to just talk about the audience or the, the art world or the art public but uh, in, in fact it's made up of a variety of, of, of individuals who have different standards and different ideas of what, of what art is. Um, but there's also the question, does a work of art have to have an audience to become a work of art? If, if, if I make a, a beautiful sculpture but I, I put it away in, 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 the, in my attic and nobody ever sees it. Does it never become a work of art? So audience appraisal, it's a problematic concept if you're going to use it to define works of art. Um, anybody have any further thoughts on the role of the audience in determining something as a work of art. Yeah, Anthony. Because about that question was about was it high and low art? And is that is it the um, there are certain sort of designated audiences for high art and others for yeah. low art? Is, is that how it works? Well I think that's another big question, yeah. Um, these writers, these these philosophers, it seems to me are pretty much fixated on high art. Mm -hmm. So therefore when they talk about the, the art world, they are talking about the, the critics who write in journals and the, and the galleries, you know, people with, art, with degrees in, in fine art. But as soon as we turn to, to popular art, and I, I don't think there's an absolute category distinction there, it's a, 
it's a fluid and, 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 and changeable um, border, if it's a border at all. But um, when it comes to more popular art, it's, it's much harder to say who, who, the, who the audience is. Um, we're also beginning to touch on something I haven't touched on, but it, it's clearly important, and that's the, the notion of evaluation. Is the, is the very concept of art an evaluative concept? Uh, or is the concept of literature an evaluative concept? Is something which is uh, made of words and, and is, let's say, fictional, is it necessarily literature or does it only become literature when it achieves a certain status or produces a certain experience? Um, but, but historically, clearly, this, this changes. Um, if I think back, I don't know, um, 40, 50 years, I, I don't think I ever saw a review in a journal like, I don't know, the Guardian newspaper, the Times newspaper, or um, a, a, a weekly magazine like, like New Statesman or The Listener. I don't think I ever saw a serious critical appraisal of a pop concert, let us say. It, th that was just below the radar of the people who wrote about art. And then gradually more and more uh, pop popular art was raised to the status of, of high art, or at least it got the serious attention of reviewers and critics. And then there were books about, you know, Bob Dylan or Patti Smith, alongside the books about Beethoven and uh, Benjamin Britten. So these things, these things certainly, certainly change. Um, and, and in a way, I suppose you could say, emphasizing the, the um, capacity of an art world, be it the, the art world of this rather refined set of, of judges or the general popula populace who, who respond positively to this or that song or photograph, TV series. If you make the judgment entirely judgment of whether something is art or not, or good art or not, entirely the, a matter for kind of, you know, a vote, as it were, among the people who are responding to it. You, you, you do run into to some problems, but it's a, it's, a, it's a way of kind of escaping some of the most vexed issues um, to do with what art is. It's a way of saying, well, we're not going to attempt to say what art is, we're just going to accept the view of the majority, if you like. Well, in one case, maybe the majority, in another case, the view of those entitled to judge, but that's always going to be a bit problematic. Any, any further thoughts? Well, I just, it was a related question on behalf of a student who isn't here, I think. So Nihal, one of the undergraduates wrote an essay which was about popular fiction versus literary fiction in the right, and how, how do you distinguish between those? And, and one of the, I mean, it struck me that some, what she was really saying that you know, some people write novels deliberately wanting to get them in the book of prize list, or whatever, that they're writing literary. Mm -hmm. Others might accidentally become considered a literature afterwards. And I was thinking of the case of Sherlock Holmes. I mean, this is detective fiction, popular fiction, which I guess these days we think of as literature rather than just mm. genre fiction and so is there, is there another criterion, criterion here which is about posterity deciding whether it's literature or not? Well isn't that part of the, the constant changing, the constant fluidity of, of the canon? You know there have been many many arguments about what constitutes the canon of, of literature or of, of art in various, in various genres. And the canon is retrospectively constituted and um, constantly open to, to change. So a poet like John Donne kind of disappears from sight 
for a couple of hundred years and then is rediscovered in the 20th century and becomes one of the canonic poets of, of the English language. Um, and I think the same is true of the, the ups and downs of what's regarded as merely generic and what's regarded as um, high art. I mean, take Shakespeare, take the, you know, the greatest of all. Nobody went around thinking of Shakespeare in, in his own time as um, an artist. He wrote these plays that everybody loved. They were hugely successful. Only later does Shakespeare become, you know, put on a pedestal and become this, this figure for, for high art. Um, so I think those are, those are very uh, uh, malleable and, and historically changeable categories. Um, and some, some aestheticians have tried to come up with accounts of, of art and the experience of art that will cover uh, not just what's considered high art. John Dewey, the American philosopher, is very keen to argue that the aesthetic experience was not just something that the, the refined art produces. Do you have any, any other thoughts about, about that? And about, about the question of you know, evaluation, should, should a, a theory of art try to say what's good and what's not good, or is that, is that a separate question? Um, it's just a thought about the question about the audience evaluation and audience appraisal. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think like whether it be pleasure or displeasure, um, an artwork remains an artwork um, without even the, the, the pleasure of the, uh, the receiver of an audience. Uh, I think an artwork is an artwork <coughs> which, uh, irrespective of the fact that if, an audio, if, if a particular community is accepting it or not, whether it be disturbing the audience in some way intellectually or uh, on the other hand, like something else. Uh, I think an artwork remains an artwork, um, but I think it's, it's not about always praising this artwork, it's not about always getting pressure from it. Uh, sometimes, I think it's about displeasure. Sometimes I think it's about disturbing your mental peace. So that's what I think. But uh, now that's great. But are you saying that it could be an artwork, even though there is no audience saying it's an artwork? Um, I think audience is very important. Um, that somebody should actually receive this expression mm. of art. Mm. Uh, but I, I'm talking about the audience appraisal or the evaluation of the art from an audience. Person. Okay, yeah. So in that case, I think um, it's okay if you don't get any pressure from an artwork, um, if you are getting disturbed from an artwork, I think it's okay. I think an artwork is not potentially only made to um, make you happy always. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's to actually disturb your... Okay. Yeah. But it does, it does have some effect on you and when it does that, it, that it has that effect, it's because it's an artwork. So I'm thinking of, you know, m maybe a novel that's a graphic depiction of some historical episode, I don't know, the Napoleonic Wars. You might be affected by what's, by the content. Um, because you learn about, you know, the suffering of the soldiers or whatever it might be. But maybe that's not responding to it as an artwork then. You're responding to it as if it were a historical document. Is that, is that something that you would agree with? Um, I think also about the, his, uh, the graphic novels in the literature that we consider right now. Um, there is this concept called graphic medicine that we use uh, in these days, writing graphic novels and adding pictures and everything. It's also a kind of expressing yourself uh, from the traumatic experience that you had in the past. Like there are few um, graphic novels coming out. So in that sense, I think it's also about expressing your feelings, the writer's feelings. And maybe sometimes the audience can, some of the audience can actually relate to the content that is being said in this thing. Even if that is a historical, uh, it has a historical trajectory or whether it be just a fictional thing, 
I think at the end of the day, if you can connect with the uh, the work, uh, that's all that matters. Mm, mm. Graphic novels are an interesting category in this whole. Is it art? Is it not art? Right. If you think back back to the, the history of cartoons, you know, there are there yeah, serious collectors of early early cartoons, cartoons from the early 20th century, who probably would say that they now works of they become works of art. I mean, it's back to Anthony's question, really, that something that isn't art when it's produced can become art later, again because of the the way it has an effect on the on the reader or the viewer. Intent keeps nagging at me because you know that some people say you don't need, it doesn't need to have. Well, I'm not sure you said it didn't need to have intent, but could you have an artwork by accident which wasn't intended? Yeah. My answer would be, uh, in terms of the the receiver. I mean, let's say you're walking along the beach, and you pick up what you think is a, a, an amazing piece of sculptural um, carving. You pick up this piece of wood and it's, you know, it's got a face and it's magnificent. You, you think, wow, it really affects you. It really makes you feel um, uplifted by, by the skill with which this particular face and the emotions expressed in the face have been, have been depicted. Um, and then you realize it's just a piece of driftwood. It's not been carved at all. It's just an accident. What 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 happens then? Do you still find it emotionally powerful? Or does 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 it stop being powerful? What what do you think? That's where it's really about the individual. It's about the person's perception of that I mean, They might think that even though nobody actually sculpted it or created it, it's a piece of art. Okay. It doesn't have to be the same for everybody else. Okay. So maybe. So you you, you I'm think? I'm just gonna say it's like you know, oh, it's subjective and throw it under that bag. But it it really could be something like that. Okay, Pavel, you had a thought too. Yeah. So, even if there is no author, but uh, if a uh, person, uh, if an audience considers something an art, it might be enough for. very interesting thank you the artist himself or herself is is a receiver as well as a producer so that um, 
even if nobody else sees this work of art or reads this work of writing um, it is art because the person who created it takes it to be art is that is that is that valid yeah If that's the case, what about the urinal? The person who made that did it in a factory for making hundreds of those things. So certainly wasn't making a work of art. If it is a work of art, it's because Marcel Duchamp took it out of the factory, or out of the bathroom, put it in the museum. Um, which, which still could be what you're saying, it's still, the artist is still doing something, only it's not the traditional idea of making as an exercise of skill, it's an, ex it's an exercise of brain work, what, what we call conceptual art. So he had the idea of challenging the institution by saying, look, here's something, it's shapely it's all you know it's got a almost kind of feminine shape and i'm just going to sign it and see what you think um so so i i, I think what you say could still be relevant to conceptual art um you know there are a, a, a composer like john cage can write a um a work of music which is just words you know think of a green caterpillar and play accordingly. M many other composers have, have done this. So it's, it's conceptual rather than material, but it's still, it's still uh, a process. However, the, I mean, the counter argument would be um, plenty of people try to make works of art using the same process. You know, they paint or they write and revise and make sonnets but they'd never achieve the status of a work of art they never recognized to be a work of art they fail um, so it would be hard to see that the process was actually part of um, what made it succeed as a work of art it would have to be a successful process and then we then we're up these questions again about what counts as a successful work of art Yep. And if we study art as a discipline and say uh, maybe the definition of an institution and all these things makes art an art, like what, what makes art a unique discipline in that sense? Because for me at least when I think of art as a discipline, it's the autonomy and the freedom it gives to people, uh, you know, having and attaching some definitions as they want. And like if we fix like art definition and maybe also the experience of it in a certain way, what makes art as a discipline unique from uh, the other disciplines that we are studying? That's the question. <laughs> 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 let's, let, let's just, we'll come back to that, but I, I'm still thinking of Pavel's point about the Mona Lisa would still be a work of art even if it ceased to exist in, in every possible reproduction. Um, which, which is a kind of a, a idea of conceptual art because we only, we only then have the concept of the Mona Lisa. Um, but it goes against, it's, a, it's an idealist 
uh, theory of art then because it goes against the idea that the singularity of the, the artwork is crucial um, there have been philosophers who, 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 who like to think of art not as the object but as the idea that it represents so famous Italian uh, esthetician Croce argued in that in that in that sense um, it's related to the idea of art as expression because if what's important is the artist's own idea and maybe feeling that then goes into the the, art, the work of art finally what's not what's less important is the form and material of the object but what what went into it or what lies behind it um, but I'd, I'd like to know if other people agree with Pavel that the, the Mona Lisa doesn't actually have to exist in order to have a cultural presence. Um, I think it's also about the context it was made. It's also about the history that it, uh, it was actually made. So if the history and if we still talk about the, maybe the Renaissance and the and then the trajectory where Mona Lisa and maybe some of the artworks of uh, Dante or Boccaccio or Chaucer, they all came from. Mm -hmm. If we talk about all of them and their works does not exist in the current scenario, if we still talk about the history where it was made, the context where it was made, I think the artwork will always remain as the same because it has the same relevance in the history. So, it does not have to be there on the wall, a uh, Mona Lisa picture or, or somewhere in the digital uh, space, but the idea of it in the history it still remains the same. I think that's what makes um, a humanities, social science or art discipline uh, mm. different, where the context it was made still remains like maybe after hundreds of years, if humankind is there. Just, just mm. that. Yeah, okay. So, so for in, in, in your view, the works of Shakespeare are high art or popular art. I want to know from you. But for you, like in your views, Shakespeare's work is part of high art or the popular art. And also, I want to know the different. Uh, how do you define uh, and uh, distinguish high art, low art, and popular? Art. So I want to know if you hear from you. <laughs> I'm not going to be drawn into that. I think, as I was saying, I think it's a it's a problematic distinction, but. <laughs> But um, the, 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 the question of the historicity of art, the, the, the duration of art, um, is, is an important one. Uh, some people would argue that the, the, the way in which a work of art is assessed, the, the, the valuation you put on a work of art, or the, the, whether one wants to say this is great art or good art or terrible art is all a matter of survival. The works of art that survive, if we still read Chaucer or Milton or Shakespeare, if we still enjoy the paintings of, of um, Raphael or Rembrandt, it shows that they're great art because they wouldn't have survived. The, 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 the current context being so different from the original context <coughs> is not doesn't make it disappear but it's reinvented in, in a new context yeah against that um, that notion of uh, the lastingness of the work of art as, a, as an indicator of its value um, would be an argument that whether something lasts or not is is contingent it's it's just a historical accident and if history, if the, if the history of Western culture had been different, we wouldn't be admiring Shakespeare at the moment. We'd, we'd find, I don't know, Christopher Marlowe would be our, our greatest dramatist. Um, <clears throat> why should the accidents of history, which are external to, to, to artworks, they have to do with um, economic and political and social developments, uh, why should we say that they are the determining factors in what's great art or not? I mean, the example of Dunn that I, that I gave you earlier would, would be one. <coughs> um, if a certain um, 
constellation of, of ideas and values hadn't started to circulate in the early 20th century, which made Dunn appear to be an attractive and interesting and valuable and moving and powerful poet, he might never have been resuscitated. Dunn might still be a little known name. I don't know what you think of that argument. Is it, is it something inherent in Shakespeare that makes him survive centuries and also wonderfully transportable across cultures? Or is it just a contingent series of historical accidents that have made Shakespeare the great, the great playwright? Black yeah, yeah. And that that's not considered a great art because I mean, well it fits into some of the categories we were talking about because it, when we think of his black square, we're not thinking of his black square, we're just thinking of the idea of painting a black square and calling it art, maybe as firms and mm. not the brush strokes. No, so it's a that. conceptual it's this conceptual thing. Uh, yeah. But and yet it's also very historically you, you can't really understand it without understanding Russian revolutionary art, uh, which I've also told us uh, plenty about in, in the past. In, so it's a sort of, it is historically contingent. Mm. I appreciate mm. that. If someone did that today, we'd go, sorry, no, it's not mm. that as well. Mm. It's fitted in that historical moment in the history of the development of art. Mm. If something can only be appreciated as art, if you understand its historical context, and the Malevich's black squares would be a very good example, is it still a work of art? Is it, is it, did it, was it a work of art in its time, but it's no longer a work of art? Because to understand it as a work of art is to, to conduct a historical exercise and to intellectually say, oh yes, I can see why. When it was first done, it was profound, it affected people, but now it's not, it's not, it's, it's not a work of art, because I don't feel it. Maybe the same for this. Um, so many other artists, and Duchamp himself, um, have produced, they're called ready-mades. So the, Instead of making a work of art, you take something ready-made, you take a, an object and you put it in the museum. Maybe, it, maybe it's become trivialized, so, so we don't think of it as art anymore. Um, would that be right? Or we'd go back to Pavel's idea, maybe it, it's still there as a concept, even, even if the actual work of art doesn't stir us in the same way. But because it's a conceptual work of art, the, the idea that a pure black square can be revolutionary is itself a, an aesthetic idea, maybe. Uh, 
And most of these concepts are not relevant for today. But we can enjoy them, we can, we can go through them, enjoy the stream that uh, gradually uh, has come to modern days. So. No, uh, yeah, I'm sure we can. The question, I suppose, is whether when you say we enjoy that, is that the same kind of enjoyment when we go to an art gallery and we see a painting for the first time, be it a contemporary one or an old one, and we feel a certain pleasure in, in the work itself, in that very specific singular work? Is that the same kind of enjoyment as the enjoyment? And I agree, it's enjoyable to look at a series of art moving, moving historically. Is it, uh, are those two different kinds of enjoyment? Uh, yes, uh, speaking about singularity, yes, you're right. Uh, we might even consider uh, perceive, uh, perceiving of this art in different periods of time uh, by different audiences, even like different pieces of art. Audiences at different times at different. Uh, but my point is uh, also uh, uh, we can enjoy the art even today in different ways. For example, we can enjoy it in a way uh, just as a common uh, spectator, just entering the room, watching this black screen. Yes, but in another. Uh, there is another approach that I like uh, personally sometimes. Uh, sometimes I like to sink uh, into the atmosphere and try, and try to come as close as possible to the audience of the moment when this, uh, this, uh, this piece of art uh, just appeared. Mm -hmm. And this, this is also a way to, uh, to enjoy it. Yeah. So trying to be as close as possible to this primitive, to this audience. But it, 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 it definitely requires some uh, pre-work. Yes, yes, quite. What do people think about that? But we, we sort of have this discussion in class about well, art galleries. I don't think we can talk about the on that in class, but yeah, about, and I think what we sort of said that if you don't understand also the context, sometimes Enjoy, especially mm. so maybe modern art, you don't understand what we're trying to do or whatever. Um, so if it's representational, it can be, it's, it's, it's easier to understand yeah. and to enjoy. Yeah. Uh, I gave you the example the other day, pre raphael lights, I just love them because it's nice and colourful, it's all representative, but when it gets to abstract art, you need to understand and you need to put the work in, as Pablo suggests, to understand the context and the historical. So we're back to the question of a, of a kind of limited culture of those who have access to historical information and a more popular art form where you don't need that information. Um, I thought, uh, yeah, you were going to say something. Uh, you know, anything that, that goes out in the public. Uh, I have a thought on that. 
what if nobody can actually even like connect to a single nuance of the thing that you're making? Yeah, what no, is I'm the point? Thinking about, so if, if I have a connection of say writing, if I have you know something, if I if I'm probably have written like a novel um, that hasn't been published, and if I don't want that to come out of the public, that shouldn't stop me from considering it as an artwork because that's still connected to me, if not the audience. Yeah. Like it's still not out of the public. Mm -hmm. That's still something that's to me. I think it still goes back to the question like how can we define what is art? Yeah. 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 Because I could be an audience to my own artwork as Father said. Oh. I would not want that to go out in the public and you know speak to so many people, but mm -hmm. not to speak just to me. Mm -hmm. That's still an artwork. Any other views? The importance and uh, the master masterpiece of uh, Shakespeare is impossible, but uh, the fact that uh, Shakespeare uh, was in the center of world system, uh, not only economic world system, but also in the center of uh, cultural uh, world system uh, at that at that time. Uh, at that at that time. And the fact that he uh, was able to produce that amount uh, of watchful pieces uh, made him such a huge blast of uh, such a huge class of uh, in this perpetual dynamics uh, of the arts. Uh, I think that in general. Um, uh, the, the piece of art and the arts in general sh shouldn't be uh, professional and uh, constant. Art, uh, art develops, art, art, arts change all the time, and even all these small authors, uh, small, I mean, in their authority. So when you say art changes all the time, do you mean Practices of art, or you mean a, a work of art changes through history? Uh, no, uh, I mean the, the, the whole the whole idea of art and the uh, forms of arts, the concepts of arts are changing. Changing, uh, right? But the uh, the importance here is that again, uh, I come uh, I'm coming back to the idea of the dynamics, the stream of arts. It's it's the same stream of arts. So um, Shakespeare is in this stream, but uh, his past, his uh, his fundament is much bigger than uh, these little bricks of other authors, uh, and uh, it's it's not a problem that some names are going into into the obscurity uh, because uh, it's like thousands of years of history of arts and it will definitely continue for I hope several more thousands of years and uh, one day Shakespeare, uh, probably Shakespeare will not disappear but Shakespeare will, will definitely uh, become less important one day, probably, <laughs> I, I don't know yeah, um, and uh, in, in this stream, uh, not these persons and not their artworks uh, make difference, but all these little changes, uh, little changes of every author and every period uh, of the arts, 
uh, bring ch changes and dynamics to this whole screen. And uh, persons, authors will be forgotten, but these changes uh, are still in this stream, and they, they are fundament, uh, fundamental for this stream continuation. Uh, so yeah, this is my job. Thank you, thank you. I'm just going to press you. Yeah. So, uh, like, I was just thinking about what if, like, you know, audience could be anybody. Say, like, the state could have a control on the forms of art that you produce. Like, for example, you may have cinema, you may have a couple of writings, and obviously they could be, like, you know, controlled by an authority that is a state. Mm. So, what if, like, you come to a place where, you know, your artworks are censored? and uh, maybe a medium to like you know push certain kind of a propaganda so i just wanted some thoughts on that yeah no that's that's obviously relevant um this talk of the art world is is sometimes too vague because the institutions that control the way people in a, in a community respond to artworks could well be political institutions rather than just reviewers and you know nice people in universities so um, th the fact of censorship which has been around you know forever is something that we have to take into account in any thinking about the institution um, and the, the, the distortions that it might well um, produce also the possibilities you know some of the most powerful works of art have been written under censorship in ways that have evaded the censor and produced produced great art. So censorship isn't necessarily just a, a, um, a negative factor in, in artistic creation. It, it can actually spur artists. I think, I think what we have to say is, you know, several questions have been about the process whereby works of art come into being and, and my own view is that we we can't be too narrow-minded about that works of art can come into being in in all sorts of ways and there's a traditional idea of the artist as someone who you know who works for months and months on a novel or a sculpture or a <coughs> uh, opera slaving away revising, bringing in new material, ch checking out uh, other bits, finally achieving the art form, I mean, the, art, the product, saying, right, this is it, finished, off it goes. Um, and of course, m many works of art have, have been and still are produced like that, but there are, there are other ways. There are John Cage using the I Ching to produce art through random, random methods, aleatory methods. Um, conceptual art, which is much more about thought processes, which might come in a flash, you know. Over breakfast one day, Duchamp might have suddenly thought, God, what if I put a urinal in a museum? Um, so it's just so hard to generalize about how works of art are produced. And if we're going to try to define art, and I'm not saying we should, I mean, the answer, the answer to the whole problem might be don't try. You might fall back on the family resemblances argument but even that is might be problematic but if you're going to try don't try and do it in terms of how something is produced or or e maybe this is slightly trickier or even i think i would say the intention of the artist M most works of art sure are produced by creators or maybe groups of creators who intend to produce a work of art but the notions of art that we have today, the, the, the art world, the theories we carry in our heads, are, are quite new. Um, our conception of art would be foreign to certainly a, you know, a 14th century audience. There, there, there certainly were poems and there were religious paintings, but they, their function was not aesthetic as we would now understand it. Um, and of course, we, speaking of someone brought up in, in the West, 
my own tradition, Western tradition of, of, of culture, has constantly brought in objects from other cultures and treated them as works of art. When the last thing that was in anybody's mind when they were produced, they were religious artifacts or you know, had some um, ritual, ritualistic purpose and now we put them in a museum and we say they, they're wonderful works of art. So that's a bit problematic to, to, to try to define art, if you're going to try to define it, in terms of how it, how it was produced, which is, which is one reason why the institutional arguments for all the problems that still remain, I think have a better chance of at least saying what art is um, to the members of a culture. Art is what that culture, the institutions of that culture, which may not be the, cult the institutions of high art, you know. What makes for a, a good pop song? Well, m maybe the things that you've learnt listening to lots of others, listening to conversations, having talks with your friends, you know, there are all sorts of ways in which you build up a sense of what constitutes a good song or a good um, orchestral work or a good um, graphic novel. Uh, so maybe institutions is too narrow a word um, and theories is a, gives the wrong implication of what, what's at stake. But it's, it's, it's the concept and the very complicated and fluid concept that you carry with you that helps you to see something as art and something as not art, or something as good art and something as failed art. And these, these are not subjective in the sense that they're just the way you feel and nobody else has anything to do with it, because you've absorbed them from your culture, from your friends, from the things you read, from the things you listen to. So they're part of a much broader sense which has its, um, which is constantly changing over time and varies from group to group, from perhaps generation to generation. But um, there is always something there that helps you think of something, think of objects or sounds or pieces of writing as art 